Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesdays for Teachers webinar. Today, we're going to explore a math grab bag with some tips and resources for your GD Math classroom. As you'll notice, there are two handouts for today's webinar, a handout that provides you with not only the slides, but also a handout that provides you the resources that we're going to talk about. I'm Bonnie Goonan, and with me today is Daphne Atkinson. So having said that, as we get going today, if you have questions, please go ahead and type them into the question box. We'll answer them as we go. Or if there are questions that can wait till the end, we do have a Q&A time. The other thing is just please note that you are all muted and that's basically because we have a very large group and so that we can have a little bit of silence, that's the route we go. But we do want your feedback, so please, please, as we go through today's webinar, if you have questions, please ask. The last thing before we get started logistically is please know that these webinars are put onto the GED Testing Service website and we'll cover that in just a moment. So having said that, let's get going with the math grab bag. You know, I don't know about you, but this is kind of where my students were. They really wondered if there was just some reason genetically that they just didn't have that math gene. Well, no, there really is no reason our students can't do math if the concepts are you know, presented in a manner that they can understand and, and to which they can relate. So as we look at math, remember it's not enough to know what's going to be on the GD test or even exactly what a question is going to be that will be used. Because we know as our students work through those different areas of math, they are using a lot of different math skills. We all know that math involves lots of areas. Yes, it does involve memory. But it also involves such things as language and those higher order thinking skills called critical thinking and problem solving. All of those things are math and all of those things we need to be teaching in our classroom, not just our GD prep classroom, but also in our ABE level classroom. You know, there really have been some changes that we've seen that have occurred in the way math is taught. And but many of those changes have been somewhat superficial because, you know, many of us may not have all the background in math that we want. So in the classroom, we sometimes make assumptions. Well, these students are GD prep, so we think they may have some foundational skills that they really do not have. Also, we know that we never have enough time. And so we may find that we have to introduce new concepts so rapidly that we wonder if our students really do have the time to practice. But we say, oh my goodness, there's so much we need to teach. We also know that because we as teachers may not have all the time to plan, that we don't always do all the activities we should or the explanations, as Daphne often talks about, making our own thinking visible to our students so that they really understand what's happening. We also know that many of our classrooms, we have insufficient practice, and because of that, we oftentimes focus on facts versus concepts, that mindless manipulation sometimes of facts. And we may, may find that we limit access to manipulatives because we may not have them, or again, we don't feel we have the time, or maybe we just think our students don't need them or won't like them. And oftentimes in an adult ed classroom, we limit that connection of the skills that we're teaching to real life situations. I don't know how many times I've heard a student say, but why do I need to know that? Well, in math, there's a lot of skills that they need to know, not just for a test, but for real world situations. So as we look at this grab bag coming forth, we really need to look at it, how important it is that we give that balanced math program so that our students really understand how math works, why it works, and also where it works. And because of that, our students really do need more than just that series of, of rules or tips and tricks. They need to know the why. 
Today, many of our students have the skills, but they can't demonstrate them consistently. This is what we see on the GD test all the time. Going from that level one skill to that level two skill, they may have kinda sorta the basic skills, but they don't have the consistency in applying them. And so that's the type of thing we need to really be focusing on. So Daphne, how about we talk a little bit about those foundational must-haves in mathematical reasoning? Do you think there really are such a thing as foundational must-have skills? Absolutely. Um, and just think of it um, in the simplest possible way. Um, you know, you go to introduce um, plotting points on a coordinate plane, for example. And if the student doesn't really have a good grasp of the basic concept behind a number line, they're going to find it really difficult to understand how to plot points on a coordinate plane. And that's what we really mean. And I absolutely echo what Bonnie just said about um, making assumptions that people have those things when in reality, sometimes they have a, a a really tentative grasp of those things and not a full on grasp of them so that you actually have some place to build um, up to the more um, complex um, concepts. So that's, yes, there are really foundational must haves in mathematical reasoning. And I think we're gonna spend some time on those today, aren't we, Bonnie? We definitely are. And we're going to start with something that oftentimes we may think, oh, Students really should know that, and those are those number sense skills. And students with number sense, and the National Council for Teachers of Math has supported this for many, many years. They're common as students with number sense, they're able to think and reason flexibly with numbers. And I really like that word that they're able to think and reason. That says a whole lot more than can they just give me as a teacher the facts. They also use those numbers to solve problems. You know, I can't think of a profession, Daphne, where I don't have to solve some problems using numbers, whether it's my paycheck or whether I actually have to use numbers to solve problems as part of my job description. And we also know that if our students would just think more flexibly, they could actually understand and spot those unreasonable answers. I mean, there's no way that certain answers can even be right because they're so unreasonable. We also know that students with number sense are able to take them apart and put them together. They can see and they can, again, undo and redo. And last but not least, they understand number relationships. They really have those skills. NCTM, National Council for Teachers of Math, they talk about that there's five components that character, characterize number sense. Those are number meaning, number relationships, number magnitude, all of those operations that involve numbers, and then numbers and quantities. So it seems like a simple thing, because guess what? They're just numbers. But when I look at number sense, there's more than just numbers. You know, to many of my students, if I said, what's a number, they'd say, oh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's it. But there's a lot more. When I was looking through some of the um, item sampler questions, I started seeing some vocabulary that I thought, wow, I'm not sure my students would really know what that was. I mean, rational numbers, irrational numbers. Some of my students really thought everything was irrational if it had to do with math and numbers. But think about it. If a student has a question and it talks about a rational number and they don't understand the vocabulary, they don't understand the difference between, let's say, a whole number and an integer, how in the world would they recognize what to do, even if it was a multiple choice answer? Those really are foundational skills. But you may say, you know what, I don't have all the materials or books to teach those foundational skills, even though you're telling me, you know what, I need to. Well, 
Daphne and I are going to provide you a number of resources out there. And don't worry about whether you can see all of these immediately because you have a handout that provides you with just a listing of all the different URLs that we're going to have today. Because of time, we're, we're not going to go through all these, so we're not going to get into them on the web, but we do want you to whet your appetite a little bit and go out and take a look at them. This particular website is part of um, the PBS Learning Media System, and it comes out of North Carolina, and it's an excellent resource that you can use with your students so that they learn the difference between counting numbers, integers, rational, real numbers, and what I love about this particular site is that it also includes a number line so they can visualize, they can see what you're talking about. Because many of our students need to be able to see that. They need to be able to view what something looks like. And so if you've not gone out to this website, please do so. Everything is free. There are just a multitude of resources out there. But talking about number lines, Daphne, why would I want to use a number line? What's the rationale for it? Well, it helps um, just to go back to the point you were making earlier. Um, it, it, it gives students a, a tool with which to begin to um, fine tune those number sense um, skills that you were talking about. Um, it gives you a complete picture of not only the positive numbers, but the place where a lot of our students struggle on the negative side of the number line. Um, and, and it's a, it's a great um, spatial orientation tool um, that gives the kinesthetic learner that, that needs that hands-on to learn, it's a great focal point for um, acquiring those skills. And Bonnie, I have a question in the question box from uh, uh, Dorothea, who said that the, um, the we'll, we'll check that um, URL because she uh, um, just sent me a message saying that the um, link that we have there um, for math is fun um, gives an error, um, it kicks out an error message that site not found. Um, so we'll correct that. We'll correct that um, and um, get back out to the group um, the way to get into that. You know, that's the joy of the Internet sometimes because they were just all working yesterday. However, there's many ways. But, you know, Daphne, do we need to really have a number line? Will we ever see that on the GD test that students actually need to know how to use a number line? Uh, well, the, the fact is that the, using a number line is a, foundational, uh, is a foundational skill that will, for example, help a student um, actually place a number. We might ask on the GED test um, how, uh, about the absolute value of a, um, of a number. And certainly having um, worked with number lines, um, answering a question about absolute value would be a piece of cake. Oh, it definitely would. And you can see this question from the item sampler. It really is about number lines. You know, I've been an adult ed for a lot of years. And one of the things that I heard over and over, because I really believe for as long as there have been adult ed classes, there have been those students who've had problems with fractions. In fact, anytime I've done a workshop on the basics, I'll ask my teachers, where do your students have difficulty initially? And they're all gonna, or at least 99%, are going to say fractions. And I think sometimes the problem with fractions is that they all learn about fractions through the use of a pizza. Now, we know everybody eats pizza, but can you imagine that if that's what I know about fractional parts of a whole, there's just going to be so much that I don't know about fractions. In fact, there's been some research done, some of these researchers, I'm not sure why they set it up this way, but researchers had shown that students begin to recognize fractions as numbers, not just part of a pizza, if they start using a number line because that way they can spatially recognize the differences between fractions or fractional parts, such as, you know, um, is one half larger than one third, or even is two over two the same as one. 
good friend of mine in Florida taught teachers how to use a number line for a multitude of things. And he used number lines, he used double number lines, he used triple number lines. And the teachers took some of those activities back and said, aha, my students now understand because they have that visual. Instead of always going and saying, okay, let's find the, the denominator, let's do this, let's do that, they were able to better visualize such things as greater than, less than, et cetera. Because we do know that one possible assessment item on the calculator prohibited portion of the test is ordering fractions and decimals on a number line. So my question to you as you're setting through this, this webinar is, have you spent time working with students on this particular assessment target? Because just something as simple as this particular item can very easily assess whether students have it or don't have it. That's our first idea for the graph bag, but it goes further. Daphne, you talked a little bit about absolute value. And absolute value is just simply how far a number is from zero. And so if they know about a number line, then as I look at both the positive and the negative, I can see very clearly that negative six is six spaces from the zero. It's not six negative spaces, but it goes six spaces from the zero. And that helps students understand that absolute value is not negative. The absolute value of negative five is five. The absolute value of positive five is five. Again, provide students with a number line and have them deserve, determine the absolute value of just a random series of numbers because I promise you with a little bit of practice, this is one item, absolute value, that they will not miss on the test. After absolute value, I think another difficult thing that we need that little grab bag activity for is inequalities. There again, we all know an inequality is a math statement that defines a range of values. But if I can't see it, if my students cannot see it, they can't touch it, they're going to have a difficult time solving those problems. And you'll notice that on this particular slide, we've taken you back to the webinar archive at GD Testing Service because you're going to find additional hints on how to use a number line to teach inequalities, a skill that students again need both on the um, computer prohibited items as well as on the test. And if we can get a few of these things taught more clearly, more deeply, then that's going to give many of our students those couple extra points that they really need to pass the test. But I can do even more. I can also take a number line and teach positive and negative integers. Many students struggle with the operations of positive and negative integers, especially if they're told that they need to subtract. Now, I don't know about those of you with us today, but I would use algebra tiles to teach positive and negative integers and to teach addition and subtraction. It worked very well for me. Some of my other friends started out with a number line. And the reason they liked it is students, again, could visually see what they were doing. Now, what we need to do again, our little math grab bag of tricks, is we need to understand that oftentimes our students have been taught that a positive times a positive is a positive, a positive times a negative is a negative, and a negative times a negative is a positive. What we've done is we've taken the operation and we've combined it with positive and negative integers and it makes absolutely no sense. But if we use a number line, we can teach addition and subtraction of positive and negative integers much more easily. So take a look for a moment at that graphic on your left. It is a positive six plus a negative two and it says it's equal to four. Well, how in the world can that be? Well, if I start with a positive six and I add negative two, 
I notice that I go to the left and I end up with four. That tells me that I'm adding two negatives using a number line. A much better way to teach positive and negative integers with addition and subtraction. Now, if I look at the graphic on the right, I notice that this particular equation says negative eight, take away or subtract a negative three equals negative five. So if I can show students that they start out at negative eight and that the equation tells them to take away three negative numbers, then I can count to the right and I go negative seven is one negative, negative six is a second negative and negative five is the third one. So my answer ends up being negative five. Now, some of you may say, well, why don't I just teach them positive times positive, negative times negative? It may be a quick trick, but it makes no sense. They don't have the concept underneath. I promise just a little bit of practice and they'll be able to easily master these operations visually. And then we'll be able to transfer those skills to those more complex algebraic expressions and equations. You know, Daphne, I don't know about you, but I wish somebody had taught me the number line way of dealing with positive and negative integers. It would have made a whole lot more sense to me when I got into some of those higher areas of algebra. I would absolutely agree. And we have a question about um, from Amy who's asking, can you use the number line when teaching positive and negatives in multiplication and division? Yes, you can. It's a little more difficult um, in my thing because again, I wasn't taught that way. But yes, you can. And you'll use multiple number lines. In fact, there's so many manipulatives that work um, for teaching multiplication and division. And even with fractions, again, a good friend of ours uses number lines and he also used, uses geo boards as well as algebra tiles. And from those manipulatives, teaches everything from whole numbers to fractions to decimals into algebraic um, expressions, equations. So the use of manipulatives is wonderful. And what we need to do, Daphne, is, is we need to just take a, a little research tour after this webinar and find a couple sites for everyone out there that will help them go that next step. In fact, what they may find are a few of the resources will give them some of those next steps as well. So thank you, Amy, for pointing that out. And again, we'll do a little research for you. Oh, what's that, Daphne? Do we have to do graphics on the GD test in math? Oh, and not just in math. Um, because if you think about it, data displays are also big in science and in social studies. Uh, it's part of a whole, um, you know, developing, um, you know, arena called data literacy. Um, and in order to answer some of the questions on the GED test, no kidding, um, people will have to actually be able to read the data um, as it's displayed, and it, and it can be displayed in a variety of ways, and these are just a, a few of them, um, and actually answer a series of short, um, uh, multiple choice questions or fill in the blanks or maybe drag and drop questions as a consequence of having, um, you know, viewed and read and interpreted the data. So this is a very useful skill to get students um, trained up on. And you notice we've given you some data displays that oftentimes we may not see as regularly, such as the dot chart or dot plot. Also the histogram, which has another very different skill than just a bar. And of course, that wonderful box plot or the box and whisker diagram. And so as Daphne said, these are really essential skills, not only for math, but also for such areas as science where they're going to have to interpret data. We've provided you in past webinars on a little thing more information on box plots, but just briefly, some of those essential skills for box plots that our students need to know is how to arrange data or data in order, how to find the median for all data, and on this test they're not going to say the median is this number, our students need to know that vocabulary, the median for the lower quartile, 
the median for the upper quartile, and of course, the range of the extreme values. Those are vocabulary, those are foundational skills that our students need. And so as we look forward, we can make it fun. There are so many things out there. It won't be long till football season is upon us again. And this is one example of an interactive from PBS Learning Media, where students can go in and they can learn more about number lines in the NFL. And as we said, we're going to share resources. Resources from places like Helping with Math, The Math Warehouse, Math is Fun, and of course, one of my favorite, The Annenberg Learner. All of these focus strongly on number lines and how to use them in not just basic problems, but to put into your grab bag and use them with all level of students. So that's the first item, Daphne, some number lines. So let's go to another one. How did you learn, Daphne, to put problems in order? Well, um, a lot of trial and error, at least uh, um, originally. And then, you know, they, um, the uh, math, math teachers I had introduced the notions of, um, you know, sort of the parentheses rule. Um, that you had to look in there first and then, you know, do whatever was there and then kind of move through it. But I didn't actually, um, I, I didn't actually have an orderly way. I wasn't taught an orderly way to do that. Um, but it does matter because it makes all the difference between a right answer and a wrong answer. Okay, guys, I've talked too much. Tell me, here's your problem. Four plus two times three. Go ahead and click into the chat box. What's the answer? Is it 18 or 10? Uh, we have brilliance out there, Daphne. I know. I'm really proud of them. I was going to say, they know that the answer is 10. And, of course, we know that it is about those that lovely thing. In fact, I don't know that I even knew that PEMDAS rule. But it is about the why. Yeah. Me either. It was not something I had used, but it is about the why. So here's another thing for your math grab bag, guys. It's from the Khan Academy and great, great route to go to take a look at order of operations because oftentimes our students will get something called PEMDAS or, or some other acronym and they forget the essential understanding that again, as Daphne said, parentheses, parentheses rule, so that parentheses and brackets, but inside out exponents but then my students would get the next part wrong multiplication division addition and subtraction because they were so linear they thought okay multiplication and division which comes first well if it says multiplication first then i must do all of it they forgot the other part of the rule in the order mm -hmm. they, appear. they appear so right. yeah so another thing is we have to get rid of those misconceptions that all multiplication should happen before division and all addition comes before subtraction. And you know, I know some folks out there who sometimes come up with a little different acronym and it's probably time to do something outside of PEMDAS. So if you've got some ideas, let us know. But the bottom oh, Amy line is- and, Amy and a couple of other people um, um, said that they learned it as please excuse my dear aunt Sally. And that is, yes, that's definitely the good old thing called PEMDAS. Now, I don't know who has an Aunt Sally, but yes. Anybody else use something different than please excuse my dear Aunt Sally? Yeah, we had a number of those. I'm looking uh, to see because people are um, responding. I just need to scroll down a little bit. Um, um, oh, Purple elephants must dance at sunrise. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> That's great. It. You know, and you'll have some teachers who will say their students create their own. Bottom line is they just need to understand order of operations and the 
correct concept. So having said that, it's your turn again, guys. We're going to do just a couple quick ones. Go ahead and tell us, type it in. What's the value of 6 divided by 3 plus 4 times 2? Do we have any answers out there, Daphne? Oh, I'm seeing a bunch of answers. Uh, uh, they're flowing in here, but let me, I see some 10. Um, I see some, uh, wait a minute. I saw some earlier ones that were a little different from the 10, but hold on. Let me pop out the uh, response box so that I can actually see. We have, uh, we had a, a, the preponderance of them were 10. Fantastic. So, and again, this is a, this is a group that's uh, got this part down pat. Yes, they do. And you know, many of our students, this is one of the areas we talk that when students use the calculator, it does automatically do order of operations, but there are times they're not going to have the calculator with them. So they need to understand. Okay, let's do one more. Okay, I'm looking at uh, a bunch of 12. Uh, we like a bunch of 12s. It definitely is. Okay, yes. we have a great grouper. You know what? I'm going to do one more because this one is going to include lots of stuff. Oh, I love that one. And for those of you who are watching, yes, I skipped one. That's okay. You'll have that one on your PowerPoint as well. Okay, the answers are beginning to come in. I have a lot of fours. Well, we have a mixed bag of things. We have a couple of people who said it was a zero. We have a couple of negative 12s and a lot of fours. And a lot of fours. We like the lot of fours. And I have a feeling as you look at the step-by-step, -step, you'll go, oh, yes, I forgot that part of please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. These are the types of things you can very quickly see whether your students understand order of operations. We've also included in this one a fun little brain teaser for students and asking them what their sign is and it's a really good one for not only having them problem solve try try again but also seeing whether they read directions because if they do they'll notice that they can use one of four mathematical signs but they can only use each sign once but you know what Daphne we made this a little tricky and some people will tell us that you didn't tell me I could use something. So because we don't have a whole lot of time, guys, if you don't want to see the answer on this, close your ears for a moment and don't look at the slide. But the only way to really get it done is to use those parentheses. And I guarantee yeah. you that as an instructor, we find that more difficult to do than sometimes our students. So order of operations is your next little bag of tricks. And there's a lot of resources again out there that you can use. One from uh, Wyzant resources, some lessons and practice problems that deal with order of operations, and then another one out of math is fun. Okay. And I hope you that know, people take away from this the whole um, idea that this, um, the order of operations piece um, because it is as a foundational piece is essential when you move to algebraic e equations, solving and manipulating. Um, you know, that's so true. Yeah. That is so. so true. Okay, next little area. Remember, these are all foundational skills is percent change. And one just 
sit back and think of all the times that you use percent or percentage in your daily life. I'm sure if you're like me, I always like to check out the sales and oftentimes those sales are very interesting to me. In fact, I remember one time I was teaching percentage and I went in and I said, guess what guys, there's this great sale at the store. And you know, I was just looking at something and the store says, 50% off everything, and today only an additional 50%. And one of my students shouted out, oh, everything's free, because they didn't understand multiple percentages. I have to figure 50% and then 50% of that. Well, that's one area, but there's also something called percent change, and that's slightly different because Again, many of our students will just say, okay, what's well, the percent change of this? And they'll be like good old foxtrot here, where when the gal says, I can't believe the workload in high school, take math in junior high, I spent five minutes on my homework this year, I'm spending a good half hour, that's a 600% increase. 600, 700% increase, 400, 1,333, oh, I give up, what's the answer? Not enough. Again, students, if they just were taught a few steps, would not be like this poor gal who had to guess, but really knew. So, Daphne, you know, like everything, don't we need to know vocabulary first on any foundational skill? Absolutely. Um, because uh, Well, the vocabulary helps, first of all, to fix the concept um, in the constellation of thinking. Um, and so, you know, in, with regard to percent change, there are some very um, specific uh, terminology that folks have to understand um, because the questions may not always be um, put to them in the same way. So knowing the vocabulary will help you understand which tools to reach for. Very definitely. So first of all, vocabulary on the foundational skill of percent change. And after that, they also need to know these following things. They have to understand percent and part of whole. They also have to understand the terms increase, decrease, and they better know the original number, the number they started with, and the difference between percentage of and percent of change. So let's take a look. First thing I want my students to know is, or I need to know about them, is do they understand increase versus decrease? Okay, take a look at this one, Daphne. If you buy a brand new car for $15,999, drive it off the lot and get into an accident, the car will be worth $11,499. Does that car's value increase or decrease? Obviously, it's decreased. You know, it does, and this seems real simple to me, but I want to make sure my students know those things. How about this one? Okay. Hmm, that one is a little more complicated. Why is it, what's the original number? At sunrise, it's, 71 degrees. Okay, and then what is it at sunset? It's 69 degrees. Oh, but see, we put that middle number in. I don't know about your students, but my students sometimes would read the 71 to 84 and just go, they wouldn't even read the rest of it. They would just say, ah, it right. went up, but you're right. So from 71 it's, to it's, 69, I have a? Decrease. You got it. One more for you. Talk me through what you think. Okay, so he goes down 30 feet below, so below sea level. He comes up 10, so he's still 20 down. Um, then he swims back down 8. Um, so has he shown an increase or decrease from his initial descent? I would say it was a small increase. It is a small increase, and you did a great job with that. 
Do you think your students would have read that one through and figured it out to be an increase? Well, what would have helped, although I didn't have the time to do it, is I would have probably drawn a series of vertical lines, just so, because I'm a visual learner, I would have drawn mm -hmm. a, an initial line that went down, so that was 30 feet below sea level. Then I would have um, brought that line up with a contrasting color by 10 feet, so I'd still know that I was 20 feet below sea level. Um, and then um, another line to indicate the eight feet um, down. Um, and then I would, I would know that he would still have um, had a, a slight increase over the initial descent. You know what you did is sometimes what we don't allow students to do, and that is really work step by step, because for many of us teaching, we see these things immediately. And right. we miss out on the fact that sometimes our students don't have even those basic skills of reading and then interpreting and then applying what they know mathematically. So great way to show us how you see things. Okay, so my students now understand increase versus decrease. Next step with a foundational skill is we have to look at where does percent of increase happen. And, you know, it may be things like sales tax or or tips or even an increase in items like an increase in the population over so many years or an increase in the cost of something that's the percent of increase and there's actually a formula for it it's called percent change is equivalent to the amount of the increase over the original amount well if I just see that and I don't talk through it with my students they're going to say hmm okay sounds good but then when I hit the first problem, what do I do with it? So we want to help students to calculate percent of increase by showing them how we complete the process in a step-by-step -step fashion, just like Daphne did a little bit ago, because it is important that we make our thinking skills visible to our students. And after we do that, they then think with us before we let them loose and that they do it on their own. So let's take a quick look. It says in 1981, there were 25 endangered and threatened species of reptiles in the US. 2015, there were 45 species. By what percent did the number of these reptile species change from 1981 to 2016? Well, the first thing I need to figure out is that change in increase or decrease. Well, from 25 to 45 says to me it is increasing. So what's the amount of change? Well, I look at the amount of changes. I had 45. I'm going to subtract 25. So my amount of change is 20. All right. Okay, what was the original amount? See, Daphne, why it was so important they know the term original. So what was the original yeah. amount? It was 25. 25. Yeah. Now, it looks like I have a ratio of 20 over 25. So I just divide the amount of change by the original amount. And I end up with decimal 8. And I'm going to write that as a percent. And so I have an 80% increase. That's how to calculate increase. Okay, Daphne, would you like to try it? Uh, it depends. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Let's yeah, go ahead. This is an easy. This is an easy, a kind of an easy one. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, all right. So we know what uh, the number of people um, is who, who attended a concert in two thousand seven. Um. And we know that the number of uh, attendees is, is said um, to increase by 12% um, mm -hmm. um, in 2017. So in order to get that, um, I would have to add, I would have to increase the 198,000 by 12%. Yeah, but that's a lot of work. Well, not so much. Not so much. Well, if I can do increase, again, I can do decrease, correct? 
things like Go discounts ahead. and sales and you know it may be a reduction in something such as a reduction in population etc so this formula should look very familiar to students and it's just slightly different the way I am going to go ahead and be able to do it so you know this looks like some of the stocks I would have bought Daphne um, a stock that I bought in 2000 was worth $18 now in 2016 last year it was worth 760 a share what was the percent of change you know actually I think I bought a stock once that ended up with what can I say I lost everything but okay um, with this particular one here again I want to walk students through. So I ask whether the amount of change is an increase or decrease. And boy, <laughs> it went down, yeah. What's the amount of change from 2000 to 2016? If I subtract, I get 1040. What's the original amount? 18. Well, now it's set up really nice. So I can just divide the amount of change by the original amount. And I get a really, really weird decimal. So I know if I get that decimal five, seven, 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 seven forever, I'm just gonna say it's a 58% decrease. Right. Yeah, not bad at all. And shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, guys, our participants, you got it? Let's see whether you have it. In June 2017, the price of stamps was 49 cents. I want you to find the percent increase from 78 to 2017. Was it a 306% increase or was it a 227% increase? And we all know that stamps have gone up from 15 cents to 49 cents. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment. I want everyone to go ahead and figure what was the percentage price increase from 78 to 2017. And Daphne, watch for the answers. And I have a feeling everyone's saying, where is my calculator? I'm getting mostly uh, the, the, um, a lot of 227%. Fantastic. And for those of you who did it, yes, our stamps have indeed increased 227%. Wow, is that amazing or what? Okay, um, let's go to one more, but we're going to skip this particular one. And let's look at something near and dear to our hearts. And that's called a laptop. And you'll notice that this does something a little bit different, Daphne, because this question says you can now buy a laptop for 14% of the cost of a 1981 laptop. What was the cost in 1981? Boy, this is making me do something totally different. So I'm gonna ask you, was the cost in 1981 1779 or was it 3071 okay so are we asking uh people hmm uh, what was the cost in 1981 hmm. all right so we so are people are we asking them to type in a question box yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let them do that. Um, I have some early answers. Yes. Uh, 1779, um, but it's uh, split between that and 3071. 
Well, I really do like the 1779 best. So we have some really excellent mathematicians out there, guys. We Good sure job. Do. Okay, we very sure quickly. Do. What are some common errors when we're teaching percent of change? These are things that I'm sure each and every one of you know as, you, as you're teaching it. Using the wrong base when calculating yeah. change is one of them. They want to put either the original price or they want to put one or the other instead of difference. They also, students are not always able to differentiate between a quantity change and a percentage change. Right. We also know those decimals to a percent, they still have difficulty in figuring out, okay, do I move it over twice? What do I do? And then even rounding. And of course that percentage of, versus increase, decrease, and last but not least, that reading. Read, they're not reading the situation carefully. So some common errors. Um, many of our students today really like watching videos. So you may wanna take the time to watch each of these videos on YouTube. There's a lot of them out there, but they're good refreshers. Um, the Art of Problem Solving is a two-part and um, then how to find the percent increase and decrease, both of them very nice and easy for students to watch, but good for your math graphics. Okay, exponents and roots. <sighs> Continuing problem, isn't it, Daphne? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, because there's a temptation, because, the, because students that lack number sense and also the vocabulary associated with exponents um, are going to try to do something that is mathematically impossible. Uh, my students just multiplied the six by the three and they got it, right? And you, yes. we know why, because oftentimes our materials start with two squared and two times right. two is four. And so if right. they started out with two cubed, they'd know that two times three is not the same as two times two times two. So yeah, continuing problem. You know, Daphne, I've been around a long time. And this was a problem on the 88 version of the test. This was a problem on the 2002 version of the test. And I think it continues to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, it does. So again, a foundational skill where they understand multiplication is repeated addition whereas exponents are repeated, repeated multiplication. multiplication. Just, just a, a very different. So back to vocabulary, they need to know the vocabulary of exponents as well as roots. And there's lots of things out there for you to watch. If you've been with, with us before on webinars or in workshops, you know that we love the math dude who is part of a PBS series. And we sometimes think of exponents as just simple problems, but it's a real strong component of algebraic reasoning as well. So this particular um, video takes you into the world of, of algebra and the law of exponents. A great video to use in your classroom, short and sweet. But anytime we see the math dude with some of these things we know, just like the Khan Academy, you have a real quality product. And I'm not going to tell you your students need to know all the rules of exponents. In fact, there are literally hundreds, thousands of them type of thing. But they do need to know some of the basics. And so here are a few of the basic rules of exponents. More than anything, they need to be able to understand what they do and when they substitute numbers in, how they go ahead and calculate them. So just one idea, and here's just a couple recommendations, because remember that squares and square roots of positive rational numbers are part of, or could be part of the questions that do not allow the calculator to be used. So if students can memorize things like the, the 12 first perfect squares, real easy. And if they know that, then they know the inverse of that between squares and squares roots. They also need to understand the difference in squaring a negative number and the negative of a square number. And they just need to be able to compute with those, um, whether it's fractions, decimals that they include or not. There again, it's not like a test is going to ask them to do the square root of 3,748. But they should be able to pretty 
quickly say what is the square root of this or what is 12 squared. Those kinds of things should be just automatic. Another area that is a calculator prohibited area, uh, questions that could be would be simplifying radical expressions. Again, it's not that difficult to do, but when students see some of the, um, the looks of it, it's very, I didn't know about you, Daphne, but it looks a little scary when I see some of those things. And yet it's not. If they can just go ahead when radicals uh, include variables, they just learn to simplify them, such as factoring the radicand and factoring out the number into its prime factors. And then you expand the variables and then bring those out. In fact, this example talks about that it's just simplifying. We see that there's a pair of threes. We bring that out. We see that there is a y squared. We bring that out. Mm -hmm. And so those should not be that difficult to teach if students understand how to group and bring out. Just another quick skill. But mm -hmm. Daphne again, do our students really need to know this for the GD test? Well, I mean, these are, are certainly fair game for, um, you know, the calculator prohibited section of the test where, you know, having a calculator isn't a particular advantage. Um, and you're showing an example um, where they're asked, um, you know, they're asked to um, simplify the expression completely. And that's exactly what you just showed. So if we can teach them just the basics um, of how to simplify radicals, then they're going to be able to, again, see something like this and, and not have to say, I mean, I can't even say it's A, B, or C on this one because I have to actually type in, keyboard in the answer. But as you said, Daphne, it should not be that difficult. So that should be part of our bag of, of tricks, of math ideas, as we're teaching those basic level students. And there again, we have a list of resources for you in this area. If it's been a while since you've been into exponents, again, math is fun, the math dude, the Khan Academy, and learning upgrade, um, which has some short little cute catchy videos as well. Um, Susan and I have used a number of these. We'll just warn you that some of their videos, you'll go down the hall kind of humming the tune before you're done. But there again, it will get the basics for students. And if they have some of these basics, then they can transfer those skills to much more complex problems. Oh, Daphne, it's all about zero, right? The incredible zero. Yes, it is. It's all about nothing. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you know, and, and that last bullet's really funny. It acquires different meaning based on its location. Think 30 versus 3,000. As I was going through this PowerPoint before I got on, I noticed that I had a 200 in instead of a 2,000 on the screen, and I thought, oh, this is not right at all. It wasn't the year 200, it was the year 2000. So sometimes a zero does make a difference. It really does. It does. Um, and you may not think there's a whole lot of power there, but yes, there is. And this is a great article from the Smithsonian Magazine about the origin of the number of zero. No, our students don't need to know about the origin, but it's interesting reading, especially if you're one of those inquiring minds that want to know. But the more important thing for our students to understand is there are properties of zero. And this is something you can very easily review with them, but they do need to understand that if zero is added to a number, it does not change the value. If it's subtracted from a number, it does not change the value. If it's multiplied by a number, it definitely changes the value. And if there's a division by zero, it changes the value. But there's a number of things here that students really need to understand those properties. <sighs> Daphne, I was surprised you didn't catch me on this one because the grammar looks atrocious, but I had no other way to express myself. I when did see I that. 
<laughs> when I talked about how many times you could throw nothing into no baskets, you know, because that's really what it is. You can express a fraction with zero in the denominator, but there's absolutely no meaning to it. And division by zero is undefined. And if mathematicians have never defined it, then guess what? I'm not even going to try. But the Khan Academy provides us with a short video talking about that and about real numbers. A quick thing to just get your students understanding a little bit better defined versus defined. So again, that real look at math sometimes is what our students need to understand all the different things about zero. Here again, we're providing you with a number of resources, not just for your students, but there again, for you as an instructor as you go forward. So Daphne, in our grab bag, we've done a little bit with number lines. Yes. We have done a little bit with, with data and all of the things there. We have done a little bit with orders of operation. Again, very important skills. We have hit percent of increase and decrease. We've talked briefly about exponents and roots. And of course, last but not least, we've talked a little bit about the properties of zero. Some really, really important things for our math grab bag, don't you think? I totally agree. And I think um, I think that the, the one other thing that I would want everyone on this call to walk away from is um, with, with, walk away with, um, is the fact that um, all of these um, foundational must-haves um, are things that once your students learn them, there's enough of a foundation for you to build off of with the higher order concepts in math. Um, part of, you know, we always talk during the trainings we do about um, starting, um, starting simply. Um, and then um, moving to the more complex. And this is yet another example of ensuring that people have the foundational concepts in place before we try to add on um, the things that really build off of those. Um, so a, a, a number of really important concepts for students to be able to hang their hats on um, as you begin to move up the math continuum with more complex conceptual um, ideas. Very definitely. So before we open it up for some Q&As and talk about some next steps, please, as, as you're working through some of these number operation, number sense skills that you need to help your students build, you may want to think about including some time for students to work together. As we said, building strong skills working more deeply into the teaching of those skills is much more important than teaching everything because we know we can't do that. And as much practice as you can with real life situations so that students are applying it through different contexts. There again, we will never ever have students see a question on the GD test that we've experienced from the item sampler or even that students have experienced from the GED ready. So students need these skills and they need different opportunities to apply them in different ways so that that skill, that concept gets built. And we do need to set high expectations for our students. I remember a teacher who, when students said, well, you know, I, I don't do math, I can't do math, blah, blah, blah. Her comment was, well, you may not be able to do this yet because I've not taught you how to do it and we've not worked together on it yet. It's that positive idea that all students can succeed and can exceed their expectations of themselves. And so all of these skills are, again, just those basics, but things that maybe they missed one or two things back when they were in school. And by building them up, all of a sudden they go, oh, now I know why this works, I know why that happened. And those skills create someone who, again, can have higher expectations of themselves as well as what you have of them. So a few final thoughts there. Okay, Daphne. Now we get to have the fun of taking a look as we get ready for those next steps of you can start looking at all the questions because 
we won't have a, another Tuesday for teachers, of course, until August. But as we're looking at the questions and as you're thinking through, we have covered three different content areas of math so far this year. If you have some ideas that you go, oh, I would really like to see a webinar in this and this. While Daphne and I are answering questions, please that include that in the question box because some of these ideas that we have created webinars have come from you, the field, because that's what we want to be able to do. So Daphne, what types of questions may we have as you're sorting through everything? Well, the hard thing is that, you know, we had the answers to the math questions, in, um, you know, uh, embedded in here as well. And so um, I need a minute um, to compile the questions. There were a lot of comments um, about um, people um, asking, um, asking for, okay, so one, one thing that people are asking for is um, recommendations for resources related to square roots. Um, thank you, Angela, for that question. Um, she says her students really struggle with this concept. Um, and not surprisingly, your students probably have a lot of company um, in terms of struggling. So, um, Bonnie, what do you recommend? I'm tempted to recommend um, both Khan Academy and um, Annenberg Learner. What do you think? Both of them are great resources, yes. Part of it, um, specifically, what are we looking for here, Daphne? What kinds of skills? Uh, let's see. Uh, nope, she didn't. So, Angela, if you would, um, no, I don't see anything. Uh, other detail there. Um, we may just need to get back to her separately about that. Okay. Uh, um, one um, other question um, that you know, or comment that came in from Aaron says, I'd like to see a webinar on how math relates to the science GED. Uh, more specifically, what kind of math is common to see on the science test? You know, and that's an excellent one. As we as we have done yep. workshops, face to face workshops, we do deal with data, and so mm -hmm. that would be a good one to be able to take some of those um, some of that information and click it into a webinar. I agree. Yes. Um, the the um, um, also from Angela, um, the sample problem um, that you gave from the item sampler is exactly what they don't understand. I think that she's referencing the um, the one where you're asked um, to simplify. Yes, and that is true. And Vicki says, um, I always explain to my students that the square root is the exact opposite of the squared number. Just like multiplication is the opposite of division and addition the opposite of subtraction. Definitely. Okay, Daphne, I'm going to start at the very front and just a couple comments out there. We're going to go back to the number line and Joseph Tucker has talked about, he said, have you ever done the number line and put it vertically for some of his students that really assist in different areas? And Joseph, that's a wonderful idea. And it yeah. depends upon our students. Again, it says to me that you're really looking at your students and being able to use things that work well. Um, so that's the comments that I see as we were looking at number lines. As we were talking about, and we talked about things like PEMDAS and GEMDAS, Marion Smith also said she uses stair steps with symbols for the operations under each step and larger steps for MD and AS, multiplication division. And Marion, that's a great visual as well. Um, you know, we had a couple great ideas that came through. And so, Daphne, you're right. We have lots of numbers here. So I'm kind of going through, et cetera, too. Um, Brian, going back to the number line, says you can translate multiplication problems into addition problems, then use the number line. And Brian, that is definitely one way to do it with the number line. Um, so great idea. 
Um, oh, did you also see? Did you also see that several people, um, Hannah, um, for example, and Katie, or actually, and um, uh, sorry, uh, Drew, um, proposed using Gremdas, uh, Gemdas, um, where um, the G stands for grouping symbols. Um, which includes both the absolute value and the brackets. A good point, I think. Definitely. And Connie, um, I'm going to click in. You have a great lesson, and I've seen that one uh, from Achieve.org to understand order of operations. And I'm going to go ahead and add that, Daphne, to our sheet before Amber posts okay. everything. Thanks. So thank okay. you for that one. We have so many of you that have done some great ideas and great comments here as well as we really appreciate all of you who took part in answering these math questions. Um, yes. You thought yes. I was kidding when I said I had to no. do a lot of um, answers. Melanie, as we were going through those questions, you are so correct. We really point out and emphasize the use of distractor pieces of information and word problems um, so much. So, and a number of yeah. folks who have, have, you know, indicated some things that they like uh, to say better than maybe the way we said it. And again, thank you for those comments. Keep typing them in. Uh, we have a few. Oh, I, I love the fact. Are you telling me stamps are now costing forty nine cents? Yes. <laughs> it's obviously, because people do things electronically and do not put things in the mail. <laughs> Um, some of your ideas right now, I do not see a whole lot of questions, but some of your ideas are you know, some really great ones. Again, the recommendations for square roots, ideas for teaching systems of equations. Uh, no, GD has not had a, a specific webinar on fractions, decimals, and percents, nor have we had a specific webinar on the TI-30 excess calculator. Um, Although we, you know, the GDTS does have calculator videos as well as some worksheets of where to get lesson plans, et cetera. We've got the math related. Uh, we have the uh, we have the calculator reference sheet poster um, yes. that you can put up in your math classroom. Um, but we certainly could add uh, we could certainly add um, it to the topic list, um, you know, for things, um, either co more content on the website, um, as well as um, you may possibly devoting a section of the um, of one of these webinars to um, a, a small demo. Daphne, one of the questions that's here is how long do the webinars stay archived? And my knowledge based at this point is that they stay archived until um, there's information that has changed, et cetera. Am I correct? correct. That you are correct. Um, we usually, um, when something changes substantially, we then remove them um, uh, to either update it if we think that there's other content that also needs updating. Updating um, the, the webinar, uh, the um, archived item may undergo um, a substantial revision, um, or we'll replace it with something else. That um, because some of these themes make the rounds um, over and over again, but just from different um, aspects. But yes, we do try to keep the um, information uh, current. Um, one more. Uh, will the certificate of completion of this webinar be emailed to the participants? Um, so to, there will, as a, yeah. a follow-up email, um, we will send you a link to the webinar archive page where you can download the certificate of completion. And usually that happens in the next two days. So you can stay on the lookout for that. Thank you, Amber. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Marion Smith has commented that she's been doing a lot of work lately on teaching vocabulary, and she's noticed that students start to use these words when discussing math. Um, and again, you're so right. If we use some of those words with students and we use the words, they have to use the words. Um, I love the Freyer model for having students apply their knowledge and setting up their own math dictionary. But you're so correct. When we stress math vocabulary and we use it, our students start using it as well. So thanks very much, Marion, for that comment. Um, Michael asked if it's possible there could be a webinar that could include the math questions from science and social studies. And we can definitely look at that too, how math is used in both of those areas and what kinds of skills students would need to have. Right now, I would tell you that there are some sample questions in the item sampler that really do look, quote, like math rather than social studies or science because most of it is in that data statistics range but definitely that would be a good idea as well to pull some of the graphics as well as the math. Okay. As I'm going through, I've got some great comments. Um, Dorothea has a great comment. Have you considered doing a webinar on the properties of one as a prelude to fractions? That is seven over seven equals one X over X. It makes common denominators so much easier. And that's a great uh, skill yeah. or concept to teach, I agree. I think that one of the things we hear um, from um, the, the instructor core is um, the struggles that students have with fractions. Um, and, um, you know, I go back to um, Bonnie's, you know, comment in the beginning. And, and one of the things that's a true challenge for the adult ed classroom is um, not to have adult learners see manipulatives as being childish. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's all about how it's positioned and the problems that you get students to solve using those manipulatives um, and because that makes all the difference in the world in terms of how they um, actually view them. Um, but fractions continue to be, it may be worthwhile, Bonnie, for us to devote a whole webinar to um, the dreaded fractions. That's true in application, you're so correct. And I had to look it up for everyone because I didn't remember when, but FYI, uh, postage went to 49 cents January 26, 2014. So uh, <laughs> it's been 49 cents for a while. Yes, it has. And Jean, yes, thank you. Getting students, she says, getting students to really understand the problems, the challenge. We have to make students good observers, thinkers, and practitioners. They like to move very fast when they should wait and study the question. And Jean, I'm not sure about you, but what I notice is sometimes um, our younger students, because they are so used to a world that moves so quickly, and because they're used to all of the activities that the world and, and computers and technology brings them, they seem to want to go more quickly as well um, and not spend always the time thinking through. And we've seen that over and over, so excellent comment as well. Uh, the other thing we would love to leave with you as well is that um, students are also um, convinced that, um, you know, reading is something they do for language arts and it's not so uh, much a skill that they have to bring to math. But I think as everyone on this call will agree, and certainly from the examples that you've seen today, reading is fundamental for math as well. Um, and, and getting to Jean's comment, getting students to slow down a little bit and read the problem carefully would, you, would um, lead to them select, their selection of better problem solving techniques and math tools to solve those problems. So we Definitely. need to keep that, in, we need to keep that in front of them that, um, you know, uh, speed does not preclude reading carefully. Definitely. And Alan has given us um, some additional support for the number line. He says when he teaches the skill, 
and he uses the examples there. What he talks about when the signs are the same, you move right on the number line. And when they're different, you move left. And that's something that I think students will come to um, the shortcut when we do talk about looking at what the equation actually says. Because if we are subtracting a negative number or if we're adding a negative number, they'll start looking directional on the number line. So you are very correct. Um, <laughs> and Janiah, thank you now that you know about letter writing and stamp cost. <laughs> um, slope, again, another thing. We, we have such great ideas and some of you are putting through some other um, ideas, Empower, a system that, yes, Angela, um, I've worked through some of that with some of my teachers as well in the past. Anything we can do to teach more conceptual knowledge and understanding and how students should apply if the resources are providing that for us in mathematical reasoning, then they really are very effective ways for us to integrate those kinds of materials into our classroom. So thanks for that. And, yeah. you know, yes, we definitely do have some um, need for some higher activities, etc. So we have Noel given some things in functions and, and some other areas, so we'll continue to look at those as well. Yeah. And I, I think the one thing that I also, um, you guys, um, you know, showed a lot of versatility in terms of how to approach these problems. Um, please remember to bring that into your math classrooms um, because students, um, are, um, you know, inclined to learn one way to solve a problem. Um, and when they come to the GED test and we tweak that problem just a little bit, um, they often fail to recognize that they actually do know how to solve that. But you just need to take um, what you went over in class and turn it just about 45 degrees. Um, it, it will go a long way um, to helping them understand um, that, you know, for example, in geometry, um, we're not going to ask them to calculate the area of a triangle. We'll give it to them as part of the problem. What we will um, ask them to do is to either find the base or the height based on information they're given in, in the problem. Um, but they may see that as being something completely different that they don't know. Help them to see the connection um, be, um, between those things. That if we give them the area and some other things, they may well have all the tools and all the information they need to solve the problem. Okay, Daphne, I think we are almost there. And Sue, um, there are function questions on the GED test. What I would recommend is if you will go out to the GED archive, we did do a webinar on nothing but functions and it will give you some of the basics because I think what you're going to see and it'll even give you some lesson plans is that if students have a basic understanding of some of those functions and function types of questions, there's some of them that are very easy for them to uh, be taught and to get correct. So yes. take a look at that. And um, if you have any questions, again, please contact us. Yes. Oh, and Daphne, we're getting more and more ideas for how people are teaching things. And I think we just need to have some time a best practice because we also have a couple great ideas, um, you know, of how to do positive, negative, and um, that's a wonderful thing of using oh, chips, yeah. piles, et cetera, those manipulatives. And Miriam, we do understand when you're working in a correctional facility that there's certain things we can't use and certain things that we can, and sometimes what we can is, is very, very limited. Um, well, I, well, the one thing I do want to make sure before we close out, um, we've got a couple of comments about um, money being an absolutely marvelous tool um, to teach mathematics with because um, adults can easily relate to that. Um, so several people, um, Alphonse um, made reference to that. Um, 
some other uh, some other folks um, talked about using decks of cards um, to teach positive and negative numbers. Um, you guys are a fountain of creative ideas. Um, the real world is incredibly powerful in um, in terms of teaching mathematical reasoning because whether students want to acknowledge it or not, they are surrounded by mathematics every single day, every minute of that day. Um, and so it's really helpful um, if you can find an entry point um, into their either resistance or the obstacles they're having by math by bringing the real world in. So thank you all of you who wrote in um, about the real world example. Okay, Daphne, I believe that we have gone through, and you are so correct, we have such wonderful ideas. Sometimes it's just a matter of hearing ideas from some of our um, cohorts and, and saying, oh, I forgot I used to do that. And that's so true with teaching foundational skills. Build your own math grab bag and start putting things in that you know when students have difficult times that, that you can pull out. Games activities, as many of you have said, using decks of cards and, and manipulatives are a wonderful way to not only determine whether students have skills, but for them to practice in a fun um, way. So, Daphne, I'm going to say to everyone on behalf of myself, um, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I look forward to seeing you all in about two months, and I wish each and every one of you, one of you a wonderful 4th of July weekend. Daphne? Well, um, I am hoping that some of the people on this call will be actually will actually be able to see them at the um, at our GED testing service annual conference in Dallas um, at the end of July. Um, I know that a couple of our um, trainers from our train the trainer cohort were on this call, and I want to thank them for making the time. Um, to be on this call because we just had a train the trainer call right before this one. Um, so thank you for um, your time and your attention and your ideas. Um, we're looking forward to seeing some of you at the conference. Um, those of you who cannot make it to the conference, we'll be um, back with you. Um, it's August. Is that our next one, Susan? Yes, um, it is. Deb, listen, I'm Bonnie. I'm, I'm like totally, um, it's been a long day, um, but a wonderful day. And so thank you so much and have a great summer. Um, and we'll be back with, uh, you know, the next installment on of Tuesdays for Teachers before you even know it. So have a great summer. Great, thank you.